thank you for joining us on Time Space Visualizer. He is a screenwriter, playwright, and author. He is BAFTA and Olivier nominated and the writer behind the brilliant West End smash everybody's talking about, Jamie. He is Tom McRae. Tom, thank you for joining us this afternoon. How are you? Hey, I'm good. Thank you very much for having me. Ah, you're very, very, very welcome indeed. Um, let's hit the ground running. Um, how was it uh, growing up? Was it a creative household that, that you grew up in? Yeah, yeah. My my mum and dad were both teachers, uh, both art teachers. And uh, so there's lots of um, books in the house, which I, I always thought was qu quite normal. But I know that was actually quite a lucky thing to have and lots of colour and, and stories and uh, lots of sort of homemade projects, which was good training, really, I suppose, for doing what I do now, which is slightly high budget homemade projects, basically. But I'm still sitting at home making stuff up which is you know it then gets passed on to bigger teams of people to make bigger things with it but it sort of starts in the same way so no, it was a good training for all of this um and also uh, my i've got a, a, a half brother who's a lot older than me so i grew up as an only child um mm. uh, it was just me in the house so again quite a lot of time on my own lots of imagination and um pretending you know that the chair was a robot the cupboard was a TARDIS you know all that kind of stuff Absolutely uh, so right. I'm sure not the only person uh, watching this who would have done the same thing uh, my um, our neighbors had a had a shower uh, cubicle which was really unusual I was great people didn't really have shower cubicles they might have a shower in the bath but at the time you didn't yeah, have a shower yeah, yeah. they had sliding <laughs> doors and we used to play endlessly with the TARDIS and just open and close these doors and <laughs> all that kind of stuff yeah you know it was it was, it was a good good practice for, for what I've ended up doing it is it's excellent stuff so how did uh, you said parents are, uh, are teachers how did and art, you know artist and, and all of that kind of stuff how did that for you become writing well i mean i suppose i do wonder if it's because my dad is a really really good artist and he can just sit down and draw anything and and, and he's really a painter and just stained glass mm -hmm. and he's really good at cartoons and he has this amazing eye and maybe I just kind of knew I was never going to be as good as him, but he's, he's quite dyslexic and he's, he's not very confident with writing words on the page. So I don't know if there was something where I kind of thought, all my family is so good at drawing, but actually I'm good at this other thing. Well, I think really it was just, I loved Doctor Who, I loved Star Wars, I loved He-Man, Transformers. And I used to just live in those worlds in my head. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to make stories like that as well. And the only way I could see to do that was to tell those stories, you know, was, was to write them. Not that I, I didn't write anything when I was a kid. I was very late learning to read and write. And I found it an absolute pain until I learned to touch type when I was 16, which was a game changer for me because I can type wow. so fast now. It's not, it's not an effort. It's, you know, I can churn out 130 words a minute easily. or well, 110, I think, last time I checked, actually. But um, it, it kind of, it was just that I loved all these Let's Pretend games. And so I suppose moving into that storytelling was being an artist wasn't going to really do that or at least i hadn't thought of conceptual artists but still their follower brief and i wanted to invent stuff of my own so it kind of was the way into it and i wanted to be a director so i started writing scripts so that i could get a way in and then that became my main job and i still do want to be a director and i and i, and I will be but um yeah it kind of just telling stories and using language and all those things but i never thought i was good at prose i just thought i was quite good at storytelling on the screen so when i then started writing books as well mm, that felt mm. like a real leap and suddenly i thought oh well, maybe i am a kind of a proper writer i'm not just doing this to try and make a film director career happen maybe this is actually the same thing and then when i did theater for the first time and with jamie being such a success and also writing the lyrics which is another whole new thing yep. so i've been learning all these new skills and and i just love it so i've, I've ended up in completely the right place it absolutely sounds like it. Was there any kind of formal training in terms of uh, writing? No, nothing at all. Nothing? No, no. I, I so, last year or the year before, time, time flies, um, I was made an honorary doctor of the University of Sheffield. So now, yes, now I have a qualification, but I didn't before Excellent. That. Excellent. Hey, listen, you know, honorary doctorates, people often say, oh, yeah, they're just given away. I would say, given given your back catalogue, you've more than earned that doctorate. Um, well, they, through... they, 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 they are just given away. That's why they're so hard to get. <laughs> well, how do you make them, how do they give it to you? There's no path to that. So, yeah. It's, no, uh... no, no, no. You're quite right. You're quite right. But what I guess what I'm saying is you seem to have done an awful lot of work to get an honorary doctorate. Well, it that's very kind said. of you. Thank you. I, I mean, Jamie took five years to go from idea to 
to opening the West End. So you could say that was my thesis. Yeah. Well, absolutely. And I'm definitely coming on to talk about Jamie in a little while because I need to hear all about it. Thank um, you. But TV work, um, you know, we're talking some fairly big name things. We've got Marple, Lewis, Casualty. Yeah. Um, it's... Casualty. I mean, yeah, Marple, Lewis, Casualty. But thank you for putting them in is the same. Is that really uh, how you would... Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> Casualty was a nightmare. Marple was a joy. I love Geraldine McEwen. We became such good friends and she really encouraged me to write for the theatre. Mm. And, um, and she died just before the Jamie Commission came through, which was a real shame because she oh. would have been there at the press night. But um, no, th- those were brilliant shows to do. And I um, mean, Marple was on the other day. It's, it's weird because my, my mum died a few years ago and she was an extra in Marple and in Lewis, but both quite ghostly ways. So in Marple, she's sitting at a table talking to um, Polly Walker, the actress who's one of yes. the lead in that episode. And they're sitting at a table and the, and the camera pans across following a, an extra carrying a tureen of soup. And so my mum's just this kind of blonde blur in the background. But to me it's clearly her and my my dad rang me up the other day and he said oh lewis has been on tv and at the end of part i think three there's mm. a cliffhanger where it kind of holds on uh lewis and hathaway being like the da, 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 and just walking <laughs> down the street back to the camera is my mum and it's really quite ghostly because you know when you know someone really well you you can't help but recognize their walk and even just the sound of their footsteps yes and, of course uh, and my dad rang me he's like he's, and he was kind of like it's lovely but i feel like i've seen a ghost he was really sort of emotional about it so yeah. she's, she's this little Easter egg hidden away in these, in these two big ITV1 dramas that are on all the time, literally like once a week they're on ITV3. Now I'm back in the UK for a bit, it's like switch on the TV and there's either my Marple or my Lewis. <laughs> <laughs> Such is having that many ITV channels, that's the way it works. <laughs> well, yeah, there was, there was only one when I, when I wrote them. So the chance of seeing it again seems so remote. But now, yeah, it's, it's, it is wallpaper. <laughs> but very good wallpaper, nonetheless. Yeah. And, um, and you created uh, Threesome for Comedy Central. Yeah, yeah I loved that show. It was, it was so much fun doing that. It was my first time I had my own show, um, and I was a, a producer on it as well, and, and it was like having your, your playground. I actually got the green light for it when I was on set for the filming of The Girl Who Waited. Um, so Nick Huron, who directed that, who I've known for a long time, Nick and I are sort of friends outside of work, and he was shooting the scene in the round white room where there's the two aimers, all the handbots are coming through the doors. It's quite complicated. And I literally got the call to say, we're green at your show. First time this had happened. So imagine the first time it happens. It's a, oh, really, wow. it's a big deal wow. every time. First time. And I, I ran to like tell Nick because he knew all about it. And I looked and he was having the most complicated choreography of the day. And I thought, I can't interrupt him. <laughs> and Karen Gillen, who at the time I barely knew was there. And I was like, I'm so sorry. I know I don't know you. But we've since become very good friends. But at the time, I was like, no, I don't know you, but I've just had my show commission. She was like, oh, and she was so lovely. <laughs> and that was kind of like the start of our friendship. But I just, I had to tell someone. And she was, I'd, I'd spoken to her a few times, so I knew her more than, I didn't know the crew. I'd never met them because I'm in, I was in London and they're in, in Cardiff. So she was like, I knew Nick really well. Karen, I've spoken to twice. Yeah. Matt wasn't there, who I knew a bit better. Um, and Arthur was off having a cigarette, I think. So uh, Karen, I kind of pounced on her. And yeah, and then we got to make the show. And it was, um, it, was, it was a fantastic two summers. I had a brilliant time doing that. Oh, I bet. I mean, it's, it's, it's well loved by, by um, quite, a, quite a number of people. It's a very small Still, group of people. But, but, yeah, it's, it's, but, well but it's one of those that's held incredibly dearly to people's hearts. That must mean oh. a lot. Oh, I didn't know it was. That's very kind of you to say so. I've, I've, I mean, I know it's been remade in Finland because um, it says it on my IMDb page. <laughs> that's how I found out. <laughs> Uh, I, I, no, I didn't know that. I didn't know anyone remembered it. Um, okay. it was me. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, oh, I, I know you. it's probably not the, the most mentally healthy thing to do to go searching for oneself on the internet. I've done it for you. Um, yeah, there is, there's plenty of people out there who really hold it really dearly oh, to their hearts. It. It. It's a really oh, nice... That's made, that's made my evening. Thank you. Good. No, it's a really nice piece. And you talk there about that, that excitement um, that you have from work. Does that happen a lot? Are, are, there, many, are there many moments of pure joy when you're, when you're a writer? Well, I, I mean, I can't speak for anyone else, but yeah, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of pretty regular. I mean, I, I suppose that's probably quite a lucky thing to be able to say, but because of the success of Jamie now, I'm only working on things that, are, that I want to do that are mine. And, um, and I've, I've just had the most fabulous set of offers. And, and so I'm working on, wonderful things which i cannot talk about but um <laughs> it just in and obviously the jamie movie we've, we've shot and that's out uh this year uh, fingers crossed you know mm-hmm. no one knows anything at the moment but fingers crossed and and that's been fantastic to do and and to kind of get the movie to it happened all very easily really for how complicated these development processes can be and so off the back of that you know yeah i've, I've 
had some fantastic doors open for me. And it, it, I was thinking the other day, it, does, it reminds me of when I did Doctor Who and that I was, I mean, I was only 25 when I did it. So I, I thought I hadn't really done anything, but I suppose probably my CV was quite good, but I'd done a lot of kids TV. And I'd never, I knew I'd never written anything that I would have wanted to have watched. Um, like, you know, that I really would have rushed home for. Yeah. And then along came Doctor Who, which was my favorite show and Russell being, you know, so generous and bringing me on and getting the Cybermen. And it was like, hit after hit after hit of just excitement and suddenly I was doing something that I was proud of and that I knew that I would have watched and then after Doctor Who came out suddenly everything changed and I was getting marples and Lewis's and scripts with like like really good money and I'd been Mm. so broke and so poor for years and suddenly it was all working out and it was like this very sizable shift off the back of Doctor Who where I went from being one sort of writer to to another sort and, and I could feel it all change and I haven't had a shift like that again since Jamie came along. I mean, so it, there's a gradual incline, if you're lucky, that you're always going up. But when yeah. you sort of wake up one morning and suddenly everything's changed in your life, and, and Jamie, that it did happen almost overnight once the show came out. And, and the, the, the huge benefit has been that I'm you know, just being able to kind of pick and choose to do the things that I want to do. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. Uh, you, yeah, you've, you've talked about your, your love for Doctor Who. So how did, how did the gig come about? 2006, there you are. We need yeah. Rise of the Cybermen and the Age of Steel. Where, where did it all begin? I got a call from Russell one evening. I'd been in at the BBC the day before, back when they, they used to have drama was divided into two departments called series and serials. I think series was basically soaps and casualty and serials was like the, the, what, the proper drama. It was the other way around. I can't remember. It was one or the other. Mm. But I'd been in to see the one that wasn't the soaps and casualty one. And the head of, of, of that um, department said, oh, I had um, BBC Wales on the phone today, availability checking you. And at the time, I didn't really know what that meant. I was like, oh, oh, that's nice. And she obviously gave it to me as this lovely nugget of news. But to me, it just didn't mean anything. <laughs> um, and I didn't realize that meant, for those of you who don't know, like I didn't, that they're making sure you're available because they don't offer you the job unless you're free or basically yeah. it's a chance for you to say you don't want it mm-hmm. before they offer it so you don't turn it down. And then that evening, I got a call from Russell saying, well, he told me, he said, you're, you're coming on Doctor Who and you're bringing back the Cybermen. And so that was it. And off I went. And it was still... Um, Chris was the doctor, and as far as we knew, he, he was still going to be in season two. And so I started ah, writing. Ah, okay. Wow. Okay. Season. So yeah. that, that, at that stage, you thought you were writing for Chris? Yeah, there'd only been two episodes of being on. And I was taken by Helen Rayner, who's my script editor, who then became a writer as well on this show, uh, taken literally down to a basement room at Television Center and kind of locked in this room, and they played Dalek on, mm. like they had the video tape. I was allowed to watch it and then had to leave, and I couldn't talk about it. So I had a sense of where it was going. And so on the first draft, yeah, he was, he was the Chris Doctor. And then suddenly that whole crazy thing happened. And God knows why they couldn't have kept it secret. I think Russell did such a good job of not giving it away. And it would have been the most wonderful surprise. Imagine if BBC politics hadn't revealed it. But there we go, it did. And then suddenly it was this new guy who was casting over on TV. And, and that was, so it was kind of weird. So he sort of regenerated in my head in, in, the, in the writing of it. Because he was Northern Chris in a leather jacket. And then suddenly it was David in a trench coat. Not that we knew it was going to be that look. I've read it, and, and I've read it recently, that, um, that people, and, and it wasn't a writer that said it, so I can imagine where this might go, uh, but that have said, you write for the Doctor, you don't write for the actor. The actor brings the character of the Doctor to it. How true is that? I mean, how much of a change did you need to make when you thought, actually, it's this guy, not this guy? Well, I'd never, I hadn't seen David do it. So it was, you just wrote for this kind of idea of the doctor in your head. But in my head, he was still Sylvester McCoy. So uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I think there's, to a certain extent, that's true. I think it doesn't have to be. I think Matt Smith was quite different from, say, Chris Eccleston. Mm. Um, and I think Jodie is certainly very different from um, Peter Capaldi. So there is, there is a difference, but equally they are there to fulfill a certain narrative function and they don't generally grow or change as characters. And even if they do, it tends to hit a reset button at some point when they regenerate. So, I mean, the phrase that was going around at the time when I was doing it, and I think Russell probably originated this was don't think of them as characters, they're action figures. They're ways that like you get in your sandbox as a kid and you tell your story. Mm. That's what it is. You're not looking for character growth each episode because they're not there to deliver that. And, and which is, you know, for the Doctor certainly is why it's because it's why the show's been around for so long. Um, with some, you know, with, with certain precinct dramas, you get to a point in season five or six where you're like, why are these people still together? It's like, you know, like, like Ugly Betty, they managed to, they juggled it right. But 
you think after all these years, you still don't know how to make yourself look pretty when you work in fashion. You know, it's, yeah. it's barely credible with Anne Hathaway in, in, in the uh, Devil Wears Prada because she's so gorgeous. So, I mean, and, and it's not a criticism of Ugly Betty because they, they absolutely got the balance right. Mm. It's just mm. not, it's not plausible under real world rules. It's all right in TV rules if you set up your, your precinct carefully and Doctor Who carries on, I guess, because you can scratch away at the surface, but underneath the Doctor's always the Doctor. Absolutely. Um, was there a stage where you got to see, when you got any sense of what David might do with this? Um, were you rewriting up to the last minute? For it? No, the, the read through, the read through was, um, was the first time. Uh, and it had, Elizabeth Sladen was there doing Sarah Jane Smith and I didn't have a clue who Sarah Jane Smith was because that was, you know, before I was watching it. And so uh -huh. I remember going round the table and and a guy's like, oh, I'm John Leeson, I'm the voice of K9. And I got cheering. I was like, okay, oh, who's the robot dog? I, 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 my, my brother told me about him because he used to watch it before I was born. <laughs> and then oh, I'm Elizabeth Slade and I'm Sarah Jane Smith. So huge cheer. And I was like, oh, I wonder, wonder who she is. Uh, and then, no, but David did the, uh, did the first read through and that was the first time we saw it. So I didn't know the accent he was going to do and none of that stuff. And so there probably was like another draft before then. Um, I don't remember. There, there must have been because my mine wasn't read through at that block, so there would have been rewrites before the next read through. Mm. Um, did we have a read through for it? Coffee must have done, mustn't we? Oh, I don't remember it now. No, we did. Yeah, we did. We did. It was the same one as the the the, the clockwork robots. That was the same read through. Gotcha. So yeah, it, it was. I mean, but I wasn't as good then, you know, as I am now. So I probably would now be like quite alive to the specific subtle differences of each doctor, mm -hmm. whereas at the time. I was just writing to Lester McCoy and then trying to slightly filter it through the prism of if it being not him and not quite, you know, his, his idiosyncrasies didn't, didn't fit into the new, the new body. But I didn't, I mean, I didn't really know what I was doing. So <laughs> it was hard for me to say. I, I know how I'd approach it now, but then I was just one day at a time, you know, got my dream job, don't get fired, enjoy it. I and mean, that's what I did. It seems to have worked thus far, thus far. I mean, yeah. it, it, Am I right in thinking Russell wanted you back for series four, but then the episode, I believe, Century House, I could be Yeah, wrong. it was, so, so they had, but it was called Century House, and they had, and I thought I'd been really clever, because Russell's big kind of breakthrough show was Century Falls. Yeah, I remember. Which was, <laughs> was still, like, something that he'd have, I knew how, how, you know, how, how big deal it was for him, how well he remembered. I thought, if I call it Century House, it's like, he won't pull the script, because it's got this... <laughs> And I even thought, should I call it Century yeah. Hall? Because in his head he'll go, oh, that sounds great because it sounds like Century Falls. But uh -huh. I, I, I didn't Century House. And it was really, I was really pleased with the script, but it was people running around a, a haunted house. And the Agatha Christie story was supposed to be Agatha, old, old Agatha, mm. telling the story of this jape in a country house. Yeah. Um, and I think the scenes of old, actual old Agatha have been released now. So you can see what that framing device would have been. I think it's on YouTube. Um, and then the old Agatha stuff was cut for whatever reason. And so what you were left with was people running around a country house. And that was kind of what mine was. So, uh, you know, I was really disappointed. But um, in Russell's position, I would have done exactly the same thing. There we are. There we are. Well, uh, and you were effectively the boy who waited because 2011, yeah. uh, you get to, you get to write. That was a terrible link, but there we go. Um, <laughs> you get you get to write for Matt and Karen, who who you mentioned earlier, and Arthur. Um, yeah, and how, nobody how, else. How differently did you approach that? Well, that was very different because Russell had, you know, he wanted to do something inspired by Spare Parts, the big Finnish audio that Mark Platt had written. Mm. And so I had a kind of start point. And in the end, it really ended up not being very similar at all. But early on, it was really, really very similar. And it was the Cybermen and they come with their own rules. And Russell really had the story he wanted to tell. And, and, and I was given the, the opportunity to play with that. Yeah, Whereas with yeah. The Girl Who Waited, I went in and pitched that whole thing uh, entirely originally so that was all my idea and i got to you know that's i therefore have ownership of that so it was it was seeing my my baby through rather than doing childcare for someone else's which are i mean i think one thing i've sort of realized for many many writers is they don't get to do a lot of their own work you know you end up particularly in the states which is where i normally live when i'm not stuck in london mm. in lockdown yep. um you you know most writers go on staff onto a tv show where you are given you collaboratively you come up with a story, but it's a very strict. So I'm terribly sweaty. It's really hot. My glasses keep slipping down my nose. So I'm, it's I'm, so I'm, warm. It's, it's not. It's not an affectation. I am just melting here. Let me. <laughs> uh, and um, 
yeah so so they you know they, they they'll contribute to the story but they'll get given the storyline there could be 20 writers in the room of different pecking order levels and a junior writer will be given a story and they'll they'll write it up and you get very very well paid for being in those mm. rooms and yeah. so a lot of writers within certainly american tv will never really write an original idea of their own and a lot of them are completely happy with that but for me i've always wanted to do my own stuff which is of one of the reasons course, why i went and did theater because in that world you get to own it and if you have a big theater hit you then cash those chips in in other forms in film and tv which is what i've been mm. able to do very luckily so for me as somebody who wanted to originate stuff getting to do the girl who waited that was like my play of the week was really special to me because it was i wasn't rewritten by steve and i wasn't overwritten at all um, i believe i was the only script that year that he didn't touch so i took that as a huge badge of honor because steven's a hero of mine and, and to get his approval really meant so much and when I watch it on TV, I think I, I wrote every single line of that, and I'm very, very proud of it. So um, it was, it was, yeah, it was, it was, you know, I was a lot older then. I knew more of what I was doing, and it was a very different experience. Mm. But probably of everything I'd done apart from Jamie, even Threesome, actually, although I do love Threesome, but probably Girly Waited is the thing I'm the most proud of. I'd say rightfully so. Um, I, I'm Thank very you. lucky. I get to interview a lot of people. Um, generally, I don't blow smoke up there. What's it? Mm -hmm. um, but I'll be hand on heart honest. I am old school. I rewatch a lot of old Doctor Who. I tend not to, just naturally, not rewatch a lot of new Who. The Girl Who Waited is one I have genuinely couldn't tell you how many times I've rewatched. Hand, oh, absolutely hand, I swear on my own life, hand on my heart. There's just something about it um, that I think the idea of getting older and loneliness and all those kinds of things that we it's a story that I think a lot of us can relate to on quite an instinctive level um, and I think that's why it's it's come back to me a lot because I think you sort of it makes you reflect and makes you think I don't know what what was the kind of what was the kind of brief you were set that ended up with a oh, story no, like that nothing 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 that was the thing because I was I was the hanging script I was the spare so you have kind of luxury of no one's really has any expectation they, they over commissioned so I was episode how many did a year did you do? It was 12, wasn't it? So I was episode 13. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, and then as I wrote it, um, I think there was, there was a couple of people within the department who really loved it and really fought for it as well. Mm. And so um, I got the slot and I had the, all the, the, the sort of peril of it not being made, but with that came the freedom of getting to do what I wanted. I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why there's no continuity in the River Song story. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what that was. So it's not it's not a character choice. It's like no one told me. <laughs> so, uh, so I just wrote a story that didn't. I didn't know what was coming before and after episode wise. Um, and so it, it was just this little kind of pocket bubble with no new characters. And I mean, randomly, Imelda Staunton is the voice of the computer, which she has like four lines, which is yeah. crazy. But yeah. uh, uh, it was yeah, it was. It was great to kind of have that freedom, uh, but with that freedom comes the risk. And it's the same with doing your own ideas in TV. You know, if you take a staffing job on, um, what's a popular, well, Modern Family's just finished, well, pick a show, any American show, take a staffing job on that. You'll be making, if, you, if you're in as a producer level, if you're like co-producer, associate producer, you're going to be on 200, 300, $500,000 mm. a year, mm. but you'll never tell your own story, but you'll Go. get that money every year and you'll get a pay up rise every year and you only have to work eight months of the year and you get four months off and then you restaff the next year guaranteed sorted lovely yeah or you try and write your own thing and you risk making zero mm. and i've made zero on so many things yes but if you keep on doing it i mean i say that if you're a terrible writer then don't keep on doing it but if you're good <laughs> um and you keep on doing it eventually something will land and when it does if it lands big you win the house so that's what jamie's been for me thank god thank god in the end something landed you know for Russell, it was Queer as Folk. For Stephen, yeah. it was Coupling. And, and then yeah. Sherlock and all the other things. But that, that thing, that tipping point thing, for me, it's yeah. um, when the, and When that seesaw kind of goes like that. Yeah, yeah. But it's hard because, you know, you, you, you're turning down a secure living for a long mm. time to, to, to mm. get that thing. Uh, but when it happens, it's wonderful. Given the choice between something more... I, I risk sounding like a knob using the word something more auteur based or something by television by committee or film by committee. I know which I'd rather watch. I'd love to see someone's. Well, don't forget Doctor Who was created by committee. <laughs> so that well, is yes, that's but, an exception but, to the rule, but yeah, very, very true. Very, very true. Yeah. But I guess like you said, there are, there are opportunities within that structure 
um, to have episodes like yours where they sit alone. Yeah. Maybe that's why I don't rewatch really a lot of New Who. Who knows? I'm well, discovering well, things about I'm, myself, Tom. I, I think New Who has got more, has given more opportunity for writers to tell the story of the week that they wanted to tell. So for mm -hmm. me, in fact, actually, there's, there's a, so the first thing I ever wrote, ever, 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 because I'm not, wasn't trained to be a writer. So I, my script that I wrote to figure out how to write scripts, which, which Russell effectively, out of the goodness of his heart, script edited for me and gave me the wis benefit of his wisdom and got me my yeah. agent. Didn't get made, but it, it got me my agent in the UK, who I still have to this day. And it was a, a script about my shitty, sorry, kids, my bad summer jobs when I was a student. <laughs> Uh, and the lead character was me, with his name changed. Yeah. Two of the lead characters were my two friends from that summer, with the names changed. And everything that happened, and almost everybody in it, was a version of something that happened for real. Right. Because I didn't know how to write. So I thought, well, if I write about something that I know really well, and there was enough funny stories that I could put them together and create a world and a, and a structure and a shape, then I might not be the best writer, but I can write this better than anyone, because this is my story. So I did this thing. Having done that, I've never written about myself again, and I've never wanted to. There's only two times when I put myself genuinely directly into a script because I just mm. don't do it. I don't, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that. In fact, it's brilliant to do that. Yeah. You no, know, Seamus yeah. was Paul Adler's childhood. That's why it was so, so amazing. Um, and, but in everybody's talking about Jamie, if you've seen it, there's a speech at the end at the prom where Pretty Pasha nails the school bully. Same speech, uncut, is in the movie. And I don't like long speeches, particularly on screen. I cut them down. But for that, it was like, I couldn't cut it. No one wanted me to. So mm. it went in the movie as is. And she takes mm. down the bully bit by bit about him being a big fish in a small pond. And that is me talking. <laughs> that's yeah. like, I could be me on stage. That one speech, that's 100% me. Everything wow. I think I feel I put in that character. And the only other time I've done it is the speech about why Raw is beautiful that um, Amy gives. About when you meet someone and you think that they're beautiful and then you talk to them and they're dull as a brick. And you meet someone else and you think, all right, they're not bad and then you actually talk to them and they become something beautiful like their face becomes them. I think I, I'm paraphrasing yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. something like that. But that speech was something I really profoundly felt. And mm. I remember I'd been out one night and I'd kind of off the cuff given this speech about something you know, about that. I can't remember the yes, context. Yeah. So in that story, I really put something of me in it, which I don't normally do. And that moment, um, I mean, I actually cut it because I, I it went from the scene and Beth Willis said, don't you dare cut that speech. You've got to put it, you've got to put it somewhere else. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this is, this must be good. Cause normally writers fight to keep stuff and producers want to take it out to streamline yeah. the other way around. Um, so if it does work and works for you and thank you for saying that, it's very kind of very flattering. It's because I really did put something of me in it. And also that thing of getting older um, yeah. and it's always been an idea that fascinates me. So, so there was a lot of personal stuff in that, which Doctor Who allows you to do because you get your, your little space that week to do your thing, unless yeah. you're doing part two of whatever story that's been set up for you. Which Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah. No, I thought it was absolutely beautiful. I'm going to move on from Doctor Who. We've touched okay. on it a number of times, but um, I absolutely, before we finish our chat, which may be a long way off because I love the next subject. The subject <laughs> is Jamie. Uh, what we're talking about, for those of you that don't know and why don't you know, yeah, why don't you? the wonderful uh, musical Everybody's Talking About Jamie. I um, may have seen it more than once myself. Yeah. Um, listen, how did it even begin to come about? Because you've written the book and the lyrics um, yeah. and then you've got music from Dan Gillespie Sells of The Feeling. How did yeah. it even start? So Dan and I are old friends and we talked for a long time about doing a musical and we had some ideas about how to do it and what to do, all of which were looking back on were ridiculously naive, but there we go. We didn't know what we were doing. Both of us with no training at all in our chosen fields. And so we went to see lots of shows to kind of, you know, gauge the competition. Mm. And as we we're going in to one particular show, we bumped into Michael Ball and Michael half recognized Dan because Dan had done his radio show and at the time threesome had been on TV quite recently and it turned out Michael's wife who was with him was a huge fan of threesome so mm. he met us we had like five minutes and said oh look, we're writing a musical could we pick your brain and he, and he gave us his number and so we ended up going to see him in Sweeney Todd in the West End with the Melda wow. Staunton oh, yes. who, who I got to me after and said oh I wrote the girl who waited and she looks at me blankly I said oh the episode of Doctor Who that you were in she looks at me blankly I was like you did the voice of the, of the computer she looked at me blankly. I moved on. Uh, Amazing. And, uh, <laughs> so it's not, not everyone's a fan. But um, so we met Michael and, and then he said, well, he, we played him, well, we sang him some songs that we'd written 
And he said, um, I, there's a director who I know who I should introduce you to who can help you try and put something together. Mm. And so we were introduced to a guy called Jonathan Buttrell, who by complete coincidence, about two months before, had seen the documentary Jamie Drag Queen at 16, which is the story that the show is inspired by. Yeah, yeah. And um, he's a theatre director who, from Sheffield who'd um, grown up in the really rough council estate, which is really quite smart now, called um, Park Hill and uh just behind the theater and he wanted to come back from broadway he wanted to do a show in his hometown he wanted to go home and he thought this story was the story to take that was not real jamie jamie campbell is is from um uh, newcastle or from mm. side and um uh, jonathan said so we'll set it in sheffield but he was looking for writers and he wanted it to feel like a movie and sound like a pop album and not be that sort of traditional musical theater thing yeah and so when michael got in touch with him and said there's these two guys who could do with some help he met us not that we knew it, but sort of secretly auditioning us to see if we thought we were the right people to do this idea. Dan and I had never written a musical before. Never no, no. Before. I'd never written lyrics other than with him, you know, nothing professionally. Mm. Um, and it's, it's a dark art lyrics. It's much, much harder than I ever thought it was going to be. It's hugely <laughs> rewarding, but it is really a lot harder than you think. Uh, and, um, and he met us and, and just thought, these are the guys. They've kind of dropped to my lap by amazing chance. And so... It was Dan's birthday two weeks later and Johnny came and he said to me, I wasn't going to talk about work, but I think I've got a show for us. And so I was like, yeah, it sounds great. And then I ran down and dressed it, grabbed Dan, who was dressed as a Cossack. Cause it was a fancy dress party. He's like, we've got a show, we've got a show. Of course. And then three years later, we opened in Sheffield for two weeks and they took the roof off the theater. And, and at the end of the first week, we got the movie deal. And then the second week, we got the West End transfer and everything has been a fairy tale. Ever Sorry. Since. Well, hang on, hang on a minute. Whoa. So, yeah, yeah. So, I know it's not, uh, it's first not of all, first happened. of all, you skipped three years of work. I mean, that must have been hard work. I mean, you're developing it was, a... It, no, it was so much fun, though. I mean, I, 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 I hard don't... Hard work can be fun. Oh, God, that's fantastic, yeah, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah. Hey, kids. It, it, um, it, was, it, was, it was just the most fun thing to do with your friends. And we weren't getting paid. So, it, I mean, we, we got, like, a, a little bit of money. I think we, we got £1,000 a year each for doing it. We got six grand between us over three years, so a thousand pounds a year. It's like Jane Austen, isn't it? Really? No, he has a thousand pounds a year. Um, so yeah, so we, we were basically we, we spent more than that on having weekends away to write it, you know, paying for yeah. it. Yeah. So uh, so we 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 worked on it and we did it out of the love of it. We put it together very very quickly mm. within a few months. Mm. And then we got caught up in a bit of theatre politics and had to wait a year to get a workshop. And then we got caught up in more theatre politics and had to wait another year to get the second workshop. And then. Um, suddenly it looked like it was all going to be a disaster because the outgoing artistic director kind of gave us a bit of a dodgy slot where no one was going to buy a ticket and come and see it. And it was supposed to be three weeks and it got cut to two and uh, okay. you know, publicity and suddenly it was, it was all going to go wrong. And then we put it in front of an audience and it, I've, never, I've never experienced anything like it. It was sitting in a room watching a show that I didn't really know if it was any good or not. Mm. And people were like screaming. <laughs> It yes. was it was just crazy, and 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 the ovation at the end, the standing ovation, and people rushing up to me and Dan, and strangers afterwards for like pictures and autographs, and it was crazy, crazy. I mean, it was like it, it, we were in the middle of a phenomenon. It mm -hmm. was just extraordinary. And I moved to LA before before the the two weeks was up. It was my only regret, really, was that the TV job I had in the states, which I got because of the girl who waited. I got headhunted effectively by the producer of this show. Yeah. Um, and, and it was, it cut into my, of all the time in the world, it could have fallen. It came four days before the end of the Jamie run. So I didn't get to, I wasn't there for the actual final last night, which was when oh. Nico Burns, our West End producer, came and, and, and gave us the golden ticket to the West End, where we still are, although everything is, you know, down at the moment, but we are, we are still resident there. Everything so, is down, but yes, still, still resident there. Um, I'm, I'm sure in whatever form things will open back up again. Well, the tour I, is already rebooked. Uh, we, were, yes. we were sold out beyond belief. Um, still Shane Ritchie, still Leighton Williams, still Shabna Galati. Absolutely. And, uh, and those who, oh, she's, oh, she's wonderful. She's, she played Ray in the West End. She's Ray in the movie and she's doing Ray on tour. I mean, how often do you get to watch the actress who plays the character in, in the big Disney movie version actually like in Leicester the, for three days in Aberdeen for four days, you know, she's, she's doing the tour and, you go and see it because she's an absolute dream. They all are the most wonderful cast. And it's rebooked now, so you can get your tickets and, and uh, go. And we, we come back later in the year, break for Christmas, then come back next year yeah. instead of concluding in November that was the original plan.
Absolutely. I will include a link under the video um, so that Thank people can much. go and have a look. And uh, theatres are going to need all our support. Please go and support live theatre. If you've never seen yeah. a show before, I couldn't think of a better one to go and see for the first time. It might set your this expectations theatre for... too high, but, you know. Well, that's very kind of you. And, and there's, there's, there's lots of wonderful shows. And if, if this is the first thing you see, I hope it's not the last thing. But we designed it very specifically for an audience of people who are not normally involved in theatre. So if you look at something like Hamilton, which is this wonderfully ethnically diverse show, the tickets are like 200, 300 quid. Mm. Like, you know, most kids are not affording that. But as Jamie, we have a bunch of 20 pound seats every single night in the West End. Yeah. Um, the, the ticket pricing on tour is dictated by the theatre, not us. So I, I don't know what they do on tour. But on the West End, deliberately, Nico, our producer, has kept prices low so that we could keep that following of kids going. And we wanted to get cross-generational. And we'd get grandparents bringing their grandchildren to see the show, children bringing their parents to see it. And mm. it really appeals. And when we opened at Sheffield, they did some research. It was something like 45% of the people, or 35% of the people that went to see Jamie in Sheffield had never been to the theatre before in their lives. Wow. Which is a really big, that's a huge number. That's so vast. If you, if you ever thought, do I want to see a show? Oh, what if I hate it? It'll be boring. I don't want to invest the money. I hope this will be the thing that would, would, would make you think you could fall in love with a stage show. Well, I, I, and I mean, it is, it's clearly a, it's a show about uh, drag and a young gay man, but it has spoken to this vast audience way beyond that. If it hadn't, it, it yeah. wouldn't still be running in the West End. It wouldn't be selling out tours. It well, it's, wouldn't be reselling it's... out tours. His mum is, is, is the lead character along with him and she's the most fabulous woman. And they're, they're two real people, Jamie and Margaret, they really exist. And, you know, Disney, the great thing about having the stage show is that when we started, um, when we started making the movie, we were still 20th Century Fox. And in the middle of it, Disney bought Fox and it became 20th Century Studios and Disney. And we didn't know if Disney were going to keep going with us because they, they, they dropped a lot of things. And, you know, as, as you do when you buy a, a movie studio, I guess, you, yeah. you, I don't know, I've not done it myself, but that's what yeah. they tell me. And, and like the head of marketing at Disney flew in to London, especially to go and watch Jamie. Uh, and I never know how much the Americans understand with the very strong Sheffield accents in the stage show, but what they mm. don't miss is the reaction of the audience. And people go crazy every night in a way that British yeah. audiences don't like, standing ovations, screaming yeah. crazy. It's wonderful to watch. And the head of marketing kind of walks out of the theatre going, give them whatever they want. And so the great thing having the stage show on as you're making the movie is anytime any journalist or, or people from the different cinema chains or anyone, we just refer them to the stage show. They watch yeah. the stage show. And by the time they turned up to meet us on set, they were already fans. It was, it's like the best marketing strategy that we entirely by accident stumbled on. So there you go, kids. If you want to make a hit movie, well, I don't know if it's a hit, it might be a flop. But if you want to make a movie, just go and write the stage show first. <laughs> make sure the stage show's on when you're making the movie. And then everyone will fall in love with your project. That's it. That's the surefire way into writing. Absolutely yes. right. God, if I could have planned any of this. I mean, there's an, uh, well, no, exactly that. Exactly that. Talking about, um, the, you know, the fan base, there's understandably there's a fan base among gender diverse people. Um, yep. I mean, given, frankly, the brutal treatment of, uh, in the press of, of trans people and also by very publicly by well-known faces that we may pre previously have respected. Do you think that, uh, that theatre, television and, of course, film, do you think that has a part to play in dismantling those kind of uh, suspicions and the discussions that surround gender identity? Because it's a relatively new... Yeah. Well, it's, it's a relatively new, new phenomenon to be spoken about publicly, I think. Yeah, it's, it's new to people like me who are, I'm not sure what the word is, like gender secure. I'm, I'm very happy being a boy and... And, and so it's, it's about being aware of other people's experiences and not just assuming that your experience is the universal one. But when you mm -hmm. grow up and you're gay, you learn very quickly that to assume that your experience is universal is, is an absolute fallacy. <laughs> yeah. I think, I mean, Jamie, to be clear, Jamie's about a boy who wants to be a drag queen. It's not, he's not trans, he's not confused in that way, and he's not challenging issues of, of identity in that way. He really just wants to, to mess around and have fun. Um, but um, it does, of course, bring in that kind of audience because we are the closest thing to telling that story that there is that's in the mainstream of, of musical theatre and we are, um, you know, the issues that it deals with are very sympathetic to that. So I'm, I'm really proud that, that that has been able to reach people. But I think just the way the arts work now is it's democratic. You know, TV can be watched by the same people that make it. You know, it's still, it's a bit of an old boys club. I'm one of the few people doing what I do at the level I'm doing that didn't go to a public school. Um, I really, you know, we are few and far between, but, but we're out there. And if you're going to, 
if you can be in the audience and, and be a, uh, someone who makes the stuff, then mm. you have every right to see yourself on screen. It's not like the old days where, you know, it was all operas about lords and ladies. And yes. if you weren't, you know, in Shakespeare, if you weren't a, an aristocrat, you didn't even get to rhyme. You know, you were just there to be laughed at. So mm. now it's like you expect to see, the, the audience can expect to see themselves on screen. That's why it's not acceptable to be casually racist to get a laugh by doing like yep. a, like a comedy blackface Indian or brownface Indian because you go, well, there's real Indian people watching this and they might want to be in this. Yes. So it's, I don't, I don't really see it as there's a duty to show trans kids or, or, or non-binary kids. I think there's a duty to reflect your audience and they are in the audience and therefore they should be on screen. All drama is poorer for not doing it. But I tell you, I'm a big fan of the Trojan horse. So what I mean is you don't make it, you don't bang the issue home. Jamie's right. is pretty, it's pretty clear. It's about a kid in drag um so you know that it's not really a trojan horse in that respect but i tell you the, the biggest one where you just watch something and you enjoy it and you don't think about is it about trans or not is doctor who with the female doctor it never yeah. makes anything about it but by doing that the statement is huge i remember yeah. seeing mr and mrs when philip Schofield was hosting it and it had anthony cotton on with his boyfriend yeah and i've yeah. never seen this is quite a while ago i'd never seen mm. a gay couple on tv presented in that way with no comment they were mm. just another couple and i thought as brilliant as queer as folk was or anything I've done with gay characters or anything anyone's done, the most politically powerful thing you can do is go to the ITV1 heartland and just present it like it's normal. That's what changes people's minds. So with Doctor Who making it Jodie Whittaker, suddenly it's going, this is just a way of telling a wonderful story. Look, the first ever interracial kiss was done in Star Trek because it, they body swapped. They had to come with a whole complex way in which it wasn't really Kirk kissing Uhura. It was yes. aliens took over their body or something. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm not an expert on Star Trek, but what you see on screen is a white man kissing a black woman and not, and that wasn't a socially realist drama. That was about spaceships and rubber monsters and, you know, cheesy effects, but they did it. And Dr. Who's doing something really special by having Jodie sit in that man's previously man's body that without having to make any big tub thumping deal, a bunch of kids are watching it going, Oh, that's, that's me. And the kids who aren't trans just go, I love Dr. Who. That's yeah. fine. You know, it, it does both. So I'm, I'm very proud of the show for doing that. Yeah, no, 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 you're absolutely right. It's a, it's a really good way of looking at it. And of course, now we have uh, Joe Martin. We've, we've now had a, a second yeah, female too. doctor. So that, that, that you know, it, it takes that even further uh, and kind of solidifies that. So I think uh, you're quite right. Doctor Who is able to do those things that maybe uh, it would be, like you say, tub thumping in, in other ways. Um, it's how dark it's getting. Ah, there we so are. I, was I was relying on the light from the window. That's not our friend anymore. Really. I could still see you all was well. Okay. Um, but yes, yeah, so listen, let's, let's, let's round up by just having a quick, let me know where we're at with the film. How is, how is Jamie the film? I've seen a couple of photographs from it. Um, yep. I need to see more of those. Um, so the sooner the better, please. Um, Richard E. Grant looks fantastic. Oh, um, he's, he's a dream, beyond a dream. Uh, he's, he's a fantastic drag queen. He's, he said to me, I wasn't sure if I could do it because he, he, he wasn't the undenied initially. We, had to, we were very kind of persuasive that we wanted him to do it. And we talked him around. Mm. He said, I, 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 I thought I, I couldn't really do it. And he said, well, my friends were so surprised. They thought I was desperate to be a drag queen. I'd be this wonderful drag queen. And I thought, what do they see in me that I'm not seeing myself? Yeah. And I said, like, Richard, <laughs> seriously? You don't <laughs> see why you're <laughs> the most fabulous drag queen. And he's brilliant. Really good. When the casting was announced, I, I have to say, I thought the same. I may, be not, I may not be friends with Richard, but good Lord, I thought that's great casting. That's he's, great he's, casting. How was he not a drag queen sooner? And I hope he will be again. Uh, um, so, listen, so do I. I mean, I, I'm, I do it professionally. Uh, so, oh, do you? Uh, oh, so in spite What's your drag queen name? Is he hard yet? Um, is he hard yet? Oh, very good. Yeah, it, it doesn't have quite the same impact because when you read it, it's spelled slightly differently. It took my brother three weeks, bless him. Um, and actually, that sounds terrible based on the name. Let's scratch that and move on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I saw, I'd always wanted to do it. I thought it was fascinating. And um, I'm clearly far, far older than, than Jamie, but I saw the same documentary, Jamie Drag Queen at 16. Ah. And that was the first thing that kind of gave me a bit of a kick up the backside to say, this, if this lad at school can do it, you know, I was working in an office job and I'd worked pub jobs and this, that and the other. And I saw the documentary and I said, you know what, let's do it. If he can do it, I can do it. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. she she has now been around for more years than I care to remember. Izzy well, so is... Ja Jamie was your, your sort of birth mother? Absolutely right. Jamie Absolutely Campbell. right. So uh, he is also responsible, as well as your beautiful musical, for my maybe not so beautiful karaoke nights and uh, stand-up show. But nonetheless, 
nonetheless, it's a it's a massively inspiring story, and I can see why you guys ran with oh, it. Oh, thank you. So, so the film out hopefully later in the year. It's October twenty first in the UK. Yeah, October twenty third in the US. We are well. I'm certainly looking forward to it. Everyone in this house is looking forward to it. I've got a lot oh, of pretty. friends wanting to book cinema trips already. So let's hope we're out of this soon so that I can get to the cinema and go and see that film. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be a, a lovely kind of cathartic moment to be able to sit in a room with a bunch of people who you love and a bunch of people you don't know and watch a musical that's all about the importance of community, the importance of kindness, how ordinariness can be super heroic and how there's no such thing as little people, which, is, which to me is what Jamie's always been about. So to, to see, you know, the kind of some renewed appreciation of nurses and drivers and, and key workers now, and I think, you know, it's, it's all coincidence, but that actually is what Jamie talks about in a non, in a sort of sideways, non-literal way. So I hope when people come out of this and the last thing they want to watch is, want to watch is a drama about COVID-19. Because I can assure you, the brief going out from every movie studio and TV network is no, nothing about COVID-19. No one wants to watch it. In 10 years, five years, there'll be loads. Everyone wants to see it. But at the moment, mm. it's like happy stuff, happy stuff. Jamie's the antidote for all of this. So I hope you can, uh, you can all come and watch it and feel renewed once we get back out there in the world. And I will only second that uh, wish. Please go and see it. And when you get the chance, do go and see the stage show as well. It's really something to behold. Tom, I want to say a massive, massive thank you. It's been an absolute thank treat you. to talk to you. Uh, thank you for your doctor. Thank, thank you for Jamie. Um, it continues to bring a lot of uh, a lot of love to the world, and I'm certain it will thank after you. all this is over. So, well, thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, uh, one I thing. Hope this, uh, this hope cheers up some people's lockdown. I'm certain, absolutely certain it will. Uh, and as is now traditional, I will leave just a moment for people to do their virtual round of applause at home. <laughs> there we go. Can, there we go. I'll copy and paste them over to you. <laughs> Tom, thanks, thanks ever so much. You take care. I'd love to talk to you. Likewise. See you soon. Cheers. Bye.